Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Past Ball Show, as always, brought to you by JohnPielli.com. ton of stuff to get into today. We're going to take some phone calls a little bit later. But right now, we're happy to be joined by a man that played in the major leagues for a handful of seasons for the Boston Red Sox, Arizona Diamondbacks, Toronto Blue Jays, San Francisco Giants, amongst other teams. And that's Shea Hillenbrand. Shea, I appreciate you having a couple minutes today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Hey, anytime, Shay. Um, the first question I want to ask you: Talk a little bit about what you're working on now, and uh, you know what what you've done outside since uh, you you're done playing baseball. Yeah, what I've done is I made the transition and used the skill set, everything I've mastered of baseball at that level to transition that, utilize that for real estate. So I'm in Arizona, and I'm doing real estate full time now. I have a real estate team out here, so uh, really, really rocking with that. Uh, really enjoying that. The real estate's been a second passion of mine. And as well, I do a lot of referral stuff all over the country, so if you have any listeners that need any referrals for real estate agents, I'd be more happy to service them. But I'm mostly servicing ball players out here, high-profile people in my sphere of influence. But the cool thing about that, let me tell you, is that uh, the revenue generated through real estate, I'm helping to fund my nonprofit foundation, Against All Odds, uh, where you can find us at, againstalloddsfoundation.org. And I founded that uh, about 2008, shortly after I was, uh, walked away from baseball. And what we are doing with that is we're leveraging uh, uh, different uh, outreaches to be able to use baseball as a platform to, to mentor kids, teach kids, educate kids, and just really teach them life lessons. I have a baseball academy in Mexico, uh, just south of Arizona, Rocky Point, Puerto Penasco, Mexico. And also do different stuff around the country. We do equipment donations, field, re- field renovation. Uh, we have a college initiative helping kids go to college. And as well, the new outreach that we've added to our foundation, which is really, really integral, is that we're helping players, professional baseball players, and transitioning up uh, other professional sports to help these players transition out of the game. Uh, it's really difficult for a lot of guys. Uh, the high percentage of guys get messed up. Uh, because that's all they've done is play baseball their whole life. And when that vision's been stripped, uh, your mind gets twisted up and you live in the past. But what, what's really cool is that we are taking these players and we're helping them out. We're helping them with business skills. We're helping them with branding skills. We're helping them leverage the platform that they have to build a future rather than allowing that platform to create an identity. So once we get these guys' minds straight, once we get these guys on the right path, who have struggled transitioning out of the game, we use these guys specifically as mentors in our foundation. What better people to use? We don't use the superstars of the game. We use the guys who have played, who have had success, understand it level, but had since retired or walked away from the game or had been pushed out of the game. Uh, these guys have gone through challenges. So we're using those guys to mentor the kids in our foundation, which primarily are kids of... Uh, of challenge situations. So I'm having a blast doing that and wouldn't rather do anything else. Now, listen, that sounds fantastic. And I tell you, you know, what we'll do is we'll continue, you know, after, you know, after we do this interview and, you know, my, my show's on every day throughout the week, we'll continue to get the word out about it and we'll continue to promote it. I think what you're doing is outstanding. Um, and I think to, first of all, to be able to reach, reach kids, anything we could do that, you know, involves our youth and brings more awareness to them and does anything to try to mentor them and help them is outstanding by itself. But, you know, another thing that you, you spoke about, which I remember speaking to you off air about, is is how we are able to, and you are with the, you know, with everything that you're doing, is to kind of give uh, athletes and players that have played um, an idea or some advice in regards to what to do after they're done playing. Because, you know, you could play in the major leagues for 20 years. Yeah, you, know, you could play for, you know, a couple of years. But a lot of times, uh, a player's playing career ends abruptly. And there isn't a lot of time to think about, hey, what am I going to do when I'm done? And, you know, once once all of a sudden it's just ended for you, I mean, I, I get how a lot of people would be concerned and would like some answers and some advice in regards to, you know, what to do once your career ends so abruptly. Oh, 100%. And uh, that's a great perspective on the situation. 
situation. And it's a lost perspective. And, and a lot of people don't understand. They're just like, well, they're professional athletes. Pull up your bootstraps. Go out. Uh, whatever, whatever. Deal with it because uh, you're the minority of, uh, not minority, but uh, you're, you're a very slim group of, of people that, that have been able to do that. But this is, a, this is the deal. is when you have a vision of the future, and when you, when you put your whole life, soul, every beating hour into this sport, which you have to, to perform at that level, I don't care who you are, you have to do that. See, what happens when you have a vision of the future, and one day you walk into the clubhouse, and the bench coach comes up to you, and he says, hey, the skipper wants to see you. Instantly, you have an understanding of why he wants to see you, and your gut drops, your stomach drops. And you take the walk of death into the manager's office, and he proceeds to tell you that you're a number, you're a statistic, and you don't fit in anymore, and you're gone. So as you pack up your bag and you leave the clubhouse, what happens is that vision of the future gets stripped of you, and your mind gets messed up. And the byproduct of that is you live in the past. So you have a lot of guys riding on because that's all we know is baseball. So what happens there is they allow baseball, that platform of being a professional athlete, create their identity. You can't do that. That's toxic. That's horrible. I mean, I'm talking, uh, uh, this is a statistic that I came up with, and I might be pretty active, but the, the number of statistic of baseball players that leave the game, 90%, this is Shea Hillebrand saying this, 90% get divorced, 90% lose all their money. And we want all of our kids to grow up to play Major League Baseball. Are you absolutely out of your mind right now? Wow. So what happens is that when you get twisted, you live in the past. And you get scared. You don't know what to do. But the thing is, is we have all the makings. We have all the training. We have all the skill sets. Because baseball is such a beautiful sport. It's the number one sport where you can train up life skills because of parallel. Baseball is life. I went out in 2004, and I hit 310 for the Diamondbacks. I was, there's five guys in each league on average, American League, National League, that hit over 300 out of 800 people. Yeah. The best in the world hit over 300. I did that, but I failed seven out of ten times to be the best. So what happens to us as professional baseball players, whether it's the big leagues, is more so in the minor leagues because they're just they're just swept underneath the rug. It's bad enough as big leaguers, but minor leaguers are the same thing, or even worse. And and what happens? We have all the training, all the skill sets to go out, and we're trying to help these guys leverage this platform to create a brand. So when you go into real life, let's close this chapter. I know you think you're a big leaguer. I know you think you're cool, but you're actually not. You're not that no more, so drop that. Close that chapter. Let's start a new chapter because when I was finished, when I walked away after being a two-time all-star in the major leagues, I accomplished all my dreams in the world. I brought home $20 million at 32 years old to the rest of your life. I haven't even lived half my life at that point. Baseball is such a small smidgen of your life. I think it's outstanding and I tell you you do go up against a little bit of resistance and you could tell in your voice and your passion behind it because there is a there's another platform on the other side that focuses on getting major league baseball players jobs let's say it's in different kind of baseball leagues or independent leagues or overseas and stuff like that and and I I, I agree with the message that you're saying listen you know what you, you play for a certain amount of time it, it, sometimes it's about acknowledging when the time is 
to move on. And I think with the platform that you're setting up, you're giving people the opportunity to think of not just about baseball or not having the ideas of baseball and being a baseball player thrown in their head, but to use the platform of being a baseball player and eventually a former baseball player because nobody plays it for the rest of their life to transform into a, another career or you know do something where you're probably going to be spending a lot more of your life doing than you ever were playing baseball. Yeah, you're exactly correct on that. And it's funny because uh, my last season was 2007, 11 years ago, a little bit over 10 years ago. And everywhere I go now, People introduce me as that. Oh, this is Shay Hillenbrand, two-time All-Star in the major. No, 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 no. I am an entrepreneur. I am a game changer. I'm, a, no, I'm one of the top real estate agents in Arizona, and I want to go on a mission. I do speaking engagements. I'm training for a TED Talk right now. I travel the world going out there and speaking and help train up people and help people build their brand, uh, help businesses, and get your mind straight because life, life is way more important than baseball. No, what I'm trying to say is I still leave a deal with it. And I don't even, I've, never, I've probably swung a baseball bat a million times and I've mastered it, so to speak, at the level that you know, very few people can do it. I don't care if I ever pick up a baseball bat again in my life. If I do, it's going to help a kid. But other than that, that's the challenges that we have. We're known for that. Like, no, dude, I'm a real estate agent. I'm, I'm building a real estate empire. And I want to pour into my nonprofit foundation. And like I said, I travel around the country, North America, Canada, Mexico, all across the country. And I speak. I speak in schools, churches, prisons. And I try to get people connected and understand their story. And connect to your story because we all have a story. And we're going to allow people to, to use their story as to empower them rather than to limit them. And I question probably a high percentage of people the story that they've created in their mind has limited them, created limited beliefs, which limits you and you don't get to enjoy life. Now, I tell you, one thing that I could relate to right there, there's the the image that you have of yourself, of what you're looking to have your yeah. legacy be and create. And then there's the public perception of how you're looked at and what you're remembered as. Obviously, you want to have the, you know, what... What, what you believe and what you created be your legacy as opposed to what anybody tells you it should be? 100%. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a fine balance. It's a fine line because uh, I'd be an idiot to totally disconnect from what I did because what I did opens up a lot of doors. But I can't let what I did become my identity. I leverage that as a platform to go out there and do things and, 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 and enjoy life. And continue on a different entrepreneurial business endeavors. And once again, John Pielli here with Shea Hillenbrand. And Shea, obviously, he's doing uh, you know a lot of good things with, with real estate. He's very successful now. He's, he's got a, a, a nonprofit charity organization that we're going to continue to get the word out and talk about. I, I got I to ask you this question, Shea. The, the idea yeah, is... Any question you want, buddy. And the way... <laughs> you, and I hear you, man. But, you know, as you're thinking now, and obviously... Yeah, you made it pretty clear about, you know, what, what you feel about what your future is going to be and your plans for outside of baseball and helping out other people. Was this something you thought about when you played or was this something that kind of came to you over time? I was that guy that baseball became my identity. Okay. Uh, and I, I had challenges because the story I told myself at 14 years old uh, that I wasn't good enough and my dad doesn't love me and I'm not lovable. And all my endeavors throughout my whole career as a professional athlete, all I was trying to do is seek acceptance and love from my father. So that's the challenge I had, and that's what I was trying to achieve my whole life. And whatever, that, that was an empty fulfilling. So everywhere I went playing baseball, every story that you hear about me all stems from the story I told myself at 14 years old. It was the demise of my career. It was almost the ending of my life.
this long-term five, six-year journey just to try to figure out why do I feel this crap inside the way I do? I felt miserable. The pain was so great. But I figured it out. It all stemmed back to the story that I told myself from one single incident when I was 14 years old. Wow, that's it. It's just like I, I had so much success in my life. I've lived all my dreams. 98% of the people don't get to live their dreams. And after living my dreams, I still have this pain, like this emptiness. I was the poster boy for this thing. Success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. That was Shane Hill and that. And that was absolutely crazy because that, there's so many professional athletes across the board, entertainers uh, or successful CEOs or whatever that that, that, that resonates with. And I'm on a mission. Uh, I'm coming to a TV show next week on the 14th, 15th, 16th uh, with Kevin Harrington, one of the original sharks of Shark Tank. I have five mentors, coaches that are helping me continue to build my brand, to continue to build my speaking platform. Uh, next Thursday, we're going to go to the Phoenix Metro Boys and Girls Club, and Kevin Harrington and Shane Hillman are going to speak. And we're going to have 500 people there. We're going to raise $100,000 in one night. That's our goal for the Boys and Girls Club. That's my purpose. That's my thing. I'm not playing baseball with my purpose in life. Dude, that's the last thing my purpose is supposed to be. My purpose is to go out there and teach and grow and motivate and mentor. I really get people connected with their true story to get on path to seek fulfillment with what they do. Yeah, and I tell you, one of the most important things to that, too, is for other people to see that there is vulnerabilities in just about every human. That, you know, you talk about having having a lot of money, being successful, doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be happiness and eternal success. So I, I do think your story and the story of many others are going to be inspiring to people because there's, there's going to be people that are going to... That they're going to have success, and all of a sudden, that rug's going to be swept right out from under them. 100%. And like I said, it's just, that's it. And that's what my nonprofit foundation's about. That gets the lot. Foundation.org is where you can hit us up at. You can reach me on Facebook, I'm all over social media, just my name. And just say, I'm doing a, I'm doing video series, I'm doing training series, I'm doing a lot of things that I, that, that I really, really enjoy doing. That's what makes me tick. I remember hitting a game-winning home run on Mario Rivera at Fenway in 2002. I was the first guy to do it at Fenway. And um, what I do now, what I pour the kids, when I, when I speak and I get off the stage and, and people come up to me and say, that hit my heart, you just changed my life. Uh, there, there's no feeling in the world other than burying my wife and uh, seeing the birth of my children that can fulfill me more than that, not even hitting a game-winning home run on Mario Rivera. Baseball is nothing. Baseball is entertainment. Baseball is simply just, it's asinine what's revolved around it. I'm so grateful to have the opportunities. I'm grateful to have everything, in, but it's just like, it's got to be perspective. No, absolutely, Shay. And listen, I really appreciate you having the time. We're definitely going to be in touch because I do want to help get, you know, get the word out over here on the East Coast. And anything that I could do to help you out with your foundation and the success that you're going to continue to have, Shay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, buddy. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. That's Shea Hillenbrand, former major leaguer. And I'll tell you this. I mean, there's been a couple people that I've had a chance to interview that have had similar perspectives than what Shea had right there. And baseball, I'll tell you, you know, if you talk about sports and entertainment being such a humbling thing, and it really is because, yeah, you, you go up there, you go through to minor leagues where there's obviously a lot of hard work. There's a lot of dedication. I mean, it starts at the very least, you being the best player in the, your prep school team in the league and best player on the high school team in the league. Same thing with college. Same thing as low A ball, rookie ball, high A ball, double A, triple A. And then you're, if you're lucky enough to get to the major leagues. And you know what? Think about how many players, and we're just talking about baseball here. Obviously, it applies to other sports as well. But how many players see their careers end at each one of those levels. I mean, mine ended at the high school level. A lot of people listening to the show could say, hey, it might have ended earlier than that. Maybe they played college. Maybe they played semi-pro or professional baseball. 
but at some point their career ended. So only the best of the best get the opportunity to go to the major leagues. But still with that, and it, I tell you, it's so interesting to think about it because the way people as fans are trained to watch a sport and follow the sport, they tend to disregard the numbers. They tend to disregard the guy that was successful in the major leagues for five years and all of a sudden, a year and a half later, after hitting you know, 300 or hitting 20 home runs in a season, their career is over. The fans are still watching the game. The fans are still rooting for their favorite team. They may have been rooting for player X while he was still playing, but they're not necessarily rooting for them anymore. They're still rooting for that same uniform that they root for with the same players. And think about all the players that end up changing organizations. From a fan's perspective, the fan still roots for the uniform. They may have, uh, you know, they may enjoy some players that moved on through one city to another. And say, hey, I like them when he played here, but, and you know, when they come back into town, they may say, hey, I don't want to see that player do badly, but I still want my team to win. And that's the perspective from the fans. And I, I, I don't think we'll ever be in a spot where we could ever, you know, where it's going to be relevant enough to where it's something important that the fans should know, but I think it's a perspective that does need to be put out there. Fans should continue being fans. And I don't think I don't think I have an issue with it. I don't think any athlete that's ever played the game has an issue with it. The fans are the fans. But I tell you what Shay has been able to do and what he's looking to do. I tell you, you you could play the game at a high level to a certain amount of time. And very few. It's such a small percentage. And I'm not even talking about the percentage of the players that actually get to play in the major leagues, but the ones that get to a certain point where they where they could be able to call their own shots and say, hey, I'm going to stop playing at this day and age, or I'll play for one more year. I've made enough money. I've had a lot of success. We're talking about players that get paid millions and millions of dollars, but they're getting paid those millions and millions of dollars with the thought, excuse me, as I take a cough drop there, <coughs> was trying to avoid that. And I'll tell you one thing that I am looking for, one of the biggest gifts that I could ever get for the past ball show would be a cough button or a muzzle, Some, something that I could put over and cover my mouth when I have to cough because there's no button I could hit that'll keep it from going over the airwaves. So for that... I apologize, but I'm going to finish the point that I'm making here. You know, you look at a, a player that, you know, gives his all and puts up good numbers, makes the all-star team, is a legitimate contender or a legitimate member of the team that they're representing for years upon years, maybe moves around and plays for a couple different teams. But all of a sudden, one day, one day it just ends. And most players don't get to make that call. Some do. You know, you, those are usually the ones that end up in the Hall of Fame. And not even every Hall of Famer gets that same opportunity. And once again, this is John Pielli, Past Ball Show. Happy to be with you on the ninth day of January 2018. As we pod that down a little bit. Moving on into the next thing we're going to cover today. There's a couple things I do want to hit up. Uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide winning the national championship. Uh, great job by them. Coming up a very, very competitive and fun game that we got to see. 26-23 over the Georgia Bulldogs. And the thing I wanted to kind of bring this into is talk about the success that Alabama has had. You're looking at a team that's won five championships since 2009. And if we're talking about teams that have pretty much dominated what they're doing right now, or the premier team in college football is probably Alabama under Nick Saban, and they've done a great job, and the coaching has had a lot to do with it. And I'll tell you, you know, if you're in the world of college sports, the coach is so much more important than it is in the world of professional sports. And, you know, Alabama's done a great job, and Nick Saban, who ended up taking a job with the Miami Dolphins in the NFL, it, you know, knew what his niche was and knew what he was better off doing. 
by being in the, you know, in, back in college football where he's having a lot of success. And I did want to spend a little time talking about the most successful teams in all of professional sports. Because if you look at Alabama and their 17 national championships, if you talk about claimed and unclaimed ones, and unfortunately it's a little bit of a tricky situation if you go back before the days of 1935 or 1930, you start to think about you know teams, multiple teams claiming to win the same national championship. So if you're looking for college football championships, the ones that are the most won, we start with Princeton and Yale. Princeton's got 27, Yale's got 28. And obviously we know about college basketball. The most national championships that were ever won were won by UCLA. And the majority of them were with you know, John Wooden as their head coach, winning all those years in 1964, 65, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 73, and 75, and then winning another one 20 years later in 1995. You got the NFL. The, the New England Patriots have a chance this year. And if we're going to say who is the odds on favorite right now at this very moment to win the Super Bowl this year, right now as we stand, I still think it's the New England Patriots. They have the best odds, the best chance, though anything can happen. They're still, still talking about eight teams that are left in the NFL. Now, do they all have the same amount of chance? No. But if the New England Patriots win the Super Bowl this year, they will tie the Pittsburgh Steelers, for the most Super Bowls ever won with six. You look at Major League Baseball, everybody knows about the New York Yankees, 27 World Series championships, 1923, 27, 28, 32, 36, 37, 38, 39, 41, 43, 47, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 56, 58, 61, 62, 77, 78, 96, 98, 99, 2000, and 2009. Probably one of the, if not the most successful franchise in all of professional sports. And, you know, you look at the NBA and the Celtics, you think of the same thing. You think of the Celtics who are maybe on the verge right now with Kyrie Irving of having that opportunity to go on another long run. They've won 17 championships. And I'll tell you, the most successful team, the most dominant team, in a short period of time, was the Boston Celtics under Bill Walt. I mean, a team that wins 11 championships in 13 years is unfathomable when you got every team that's gunning for you. And I understand, they had a lot of talent there in Boston. But man, you know, Bill Walton, you know, could say to anybody, you didn't do what I did. I mean, a win and at that stage and that level for that amount of time is something that we may never see again in the history of professional sports. And I don't know, I don't know if it's possible. I, I really don't. I don't know if there's a team that could go out there and dominate for a decade plus. I think a team can dominate for three to five years, maybe six, seven years if they could hold their star players together. It's going to be hard to do in the NBA. If you look at what the Golden State Warriors have done, if they're able to hold on to Steph Curry, to Thompson, to Durant, to all the guys that are there on that team, Draymond Green, everybody else, they have the ability to sustain their success for a series of more seasons. That being said, you never know what's going to happen, especially when you're dealing with the salary cap in the NBA. Something you weren't dealing with when we're talking about the 60s and Bill Walton. I mean, players were playing because of the love of the game. They were also playing because they weren't being compensated anywhere near the level that they are right now. And that's why you look at what's happened in football, and we'll transition back to the NFL, and you think of the New England Patriots in the last 18 years with Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. I think the main reason that they've had so much success is a lot of it's within the system. And it's the system of the coach and the quarterback who are really the only constants that are sticking around on that team. So therefore, from a financial standpoint, 
players that would normally ask or expect to be compensated are being rolled over and their roles are being replaced by other players. Which, if you think about it, it's kind of something unfathomable that we haven't seen in sports. And it's allowed the New England Patriots to be as successful as they are. That being said, as we spoke about last week, there's going to come a time where likely the quarter, the, the coach is going to outlast the quarterback. And once that happens, could you expect the Patriots to perform at that high level? Well, if they're able to transition into another quarterback, then maybe. But the system is what has worked for the New England Patriots. Now, thinking about other sports and the Celtics, you know, the Celtics are are going to have to put a system in place, but at the same time, they have it a lot more difficult to be able to sustain the players that they have, especially when we're talking about in a series of a decade. So my point is when you have revolving players that are going in and out, it's going to be a lot harder to sustain a dynasty for a decade or more. And I don't know if you'll ever see that again in the NBA. We may. I don't know if we could see that in baseball or football or even in hockey for that matter. As we hit the halfway point here on the Pass Ball Show, this is John Pielli. Number is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. We'll get you up here, talk about anything that's on your mind in the world of sports, uh, baseball, and unifying America. And I do have a message that I'm going to send out to everybody. Probably in about 10 minutes or so, we're not talking about sports, but right now we are. And I was thinking about it, and pardon me for another second. <clears throat> when we're talking about the dominance of teams and every sport has a team that you say they are the dominant and really the one sport that stands out that doesn't have that team that you could say they won all the time is the NFL Steelers have won six Super Bowls and obviously the Super Bowl era only goes to the late 60s 19 was 1967 was the first one so while the sport goes back and we could talk about AFL championships and NFL championships that existed for years upon years. The Super Bowl era is probably the most modern of all sports. So when we're talking about the amount of championships that are won or amount of Super Bowls that are won, that number is naturally going to be less than that of championships in Major League Baseball or hockey or the NBA. But what stands out to me you know, we look at the Montreal Canadiens, who have won 24 Stanley Cups. Their first one was in 1915-1916. That being said, the Montreal team actually won a series more in the leagues that were the, that you know preceded the National Hockey League. So all the way up until the last one that they won in 1992-1993, they've won obviously more Stanley Cup championships than any other team in the National Hockey League. And I'm trying to figure out, and maybe this is a good question to throw out there for people if you want to contribute, comment, you know, call in, do whatever you want. What sport would you have the best opportunity right now if we were talking about one team that could go out there and dominate it for the series of a decade? It's kind of hard to think about because for the reasons that I mentioned before, I, I mentioned a series of reasons over why it's going to be hard to sustain success. You could probably do it for five years. I think you can. Five, seven, maybe eight years. I don't know. I think even when we're getting to seven or eight, when we're talking about having this kind of dominance, you're going to have to be able to do it with different players. You're going to have the first series of, of changes in regards to a different a different series of players, a different series of core players. And obviously, if you look at different, uh, different sports, they're constructed differently, but the pay structure that's out there, and the fact that these players are all asking to be extremely compensated, it makes it tougher to be able to keep the same group of players together. To dominate, and I'll tell I'll tell you this. You know, we look at 
sports and we say from a fan's perspective how easy it is to say, hey, I root for this team. I expect them to be good every year. Well, number, there's a couple things that happen. Every year, a player, no matter what sport we're talking about, depreciates. And all of a sudden, they're not the same that they were the year before. They're a little bit less. Maybe two years down the road, they're a little bit less. Maybe three years down the road, they're a little bit less than that. Now, all of a sudden, we have to look at a spot and say, how do we change from one star player to the next star player? Now, Bill Russell, I think part of the reason why the Celtics were able to succeed so long and he ended up staying there for so long is that they weren't in the era where they were, number one, we're dealing with a salary cap. Number two, we're dealing with a situation where the salaries were rising through in the NBA where each player that was a contributor on each championship that we were looking at year in and year out was asking for more and saying, listen, I deserve to be compensated. Look at how much the player that does the same for me that's on another team is being compensated. I tell you, the era that we're in right now in professional sports is making it tougher for the team. And we tend as fans and athletes as athletes tend to look at it differently. They look at it as ownership against the player. What part is one side and what part is the other side? In other words, when we look at salary, how a player wants the salary, how the owner is in charge of, play, of paying the player the salary, that's easy to figure out player wants the money, the owner would obviously want to reduce the amount of money if they can that they're paying for a certain player. Now, when we talk about things from a team standpoint, and you think if you go back 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, when players were set and you knew from day one that they were going to be with a certain organization as long as they were able to play, and the only way that they were going to be move the only transaction that existed was trades. Or if somebody, an organization decided that a player couldn't play anymore, they'd get their outright right release. And if another team wanted to, they could pick them up. There was no th such thing as free agency. What free agency has created, obviously, is a shift in the demand against the supply, which has driven up the cost and the value of players. So when we look at it from that level, we tend to not realize what it's doing for the team. And like I said, we're talking about any team sport here that you want. But that ability that a team had for the sake of the team and for the sake of winning had to retain its own players, the cost of that has gone, has gone up. It starts with players, star players being compensated for what they deserve. And it also comes with players that are not star calibers getting compensated more by, by other teams than they are with their original teams. And the ability or the opportunity to retain the same type of players that you would have 20, 30, 40 years ago, it doesn't exist anymore. So when we look back at the years, and even, even the dynasties of the Yankees, you know, the 36 to 39 Yankees, the 47 to 53 Yankees, the Yankees from, if you want to go from 47 to 64 and all the World Series appearances that they had between those two years. Something like that may never happen again. And what we saw in baseball with the Giants, kind of a unique team that won the World Series in 19, I'm sorry, in 2010, 2012, and 2014. That Yankee team that won those four World Series in five years from 1996 to 2000. We may never see that again. And I think the landscape of the games in regards to the supply and demand and salaries, and I'm not suggesting the salaries need to go down in any way, but that system has made it very hard for players to retain their own players. For teams to retain their own players. So when you, when you thought about a team that will be together for 10 years, and if they were that good and that dominant, 
they could win X amount of championships, they're not going to have that opportunity anymore. That window, which could have been 10 to 12 years, has been shifted to maybe three to five years. So I think it's creating more parity in the world of sports. Something to think about. Once again, John Pielli, Pass Boss Show, happy to be with you. Ninth day of December, I'm sorry, of January 2017. And we're going to move into something that actually is not baseball related. And I will play a little bit of music here and there just to try to bring the energy up, man. And, you know, you think of some of the great moments in baseball history. And I always think of Mel Allen and This Week in Baseball. And, you know, had the times kind of stayed the same, maybe I could have taken over for him and kind of hosted that weekly baseball show. But obviously, what has happened now? You got MLB Network. You got 24-7 sports coverage. Whether it's on the TV or the radio. So you don't need a person giving you a weekly update in regards to what's on in baseball. But I tell you, Mel Allen, this week in baseball, that, that was definitely the thing. But one of the things that we focus on in the world that we live in. And the past ball show talks about baseball, sports, and unifying America. And there was a story that I that I will give a hat tip to off the air in regards to bringing it out to me. I actually saw it on Facebook this morning. And one of the messages that I want to send out there to people, and I have been, is that life is too short. We, we look at life and we tend to make such a bigger deal out of things than we really need to in regards to things that we stress about, things that we complain about, things that we bitch and moan and complain and whine and cry about and make little things that in a grand scheme of life are not really that important. We make, we make believe, we put this like fictitious value in stuff that really doesn't deserve the value that it's given. Bottom line, to everybody that's listening to this show, to everybody that's watching me right now, at some point, your life is going to end. At some point, my life is going to end. And everything that we overly stress about, things that we make too much of a big deal about than what really exists and what really matters is all of a sudden going to be forgotten. Your little eye makeup that you're wearing, your little haircut, the things that you're looking to do to set yourself in a position to, you know, maybe look better in front of your peers. None of it's going to matter. None of it's going to matter when you're not here, and none of it's going to matter when they're not here and when I'm not here. There's a story about a young lady that ended up passing away this past week, and she was only 27 years old. And she shares the story. She was lucky enough. And obviously anybody that passes away at such a young age, you know, it seems almost like an oxymoron to say that they were lucky. And obviously what she had to deal with and her demise and what led ended up leading to her death was not fortunate at all and not lucky. But she was given a gift of the notice that she had that her time was coming to an end. And obviously somebody that's in their 20s to have to go through that process and go through that thought and think about life which exists for you and life as far as everything that you planned in your 20s to fall in love, to get married, to move out on your own, to get yourself set up in a new career, to hopefully someday have children, have a nice family, live what we all call the American dream. What happens when you get notice that that's going to end or that your time here on this earth is not very long? And I'll make a nice parlay into the discussion with Shay Hillenbrand earlier. From an athlete standpoint, you come up as a 21, 22, 23 year old tearing the cover off the ball. You look like you got a huge career ahead of you. You're making all-star teams. You're hitting 300. You're hitting 20 home runs a season. And all of a sudden, one year's a little worse than the year before. And just like that, out of the blue, your career ends. And you've got to think of what you need to do in regards to moving on with the rest of your life, 
getting that next job, what's your next career going to be? Is it going to be involved in baseball? Is it not going to be involved in baseball? But what do you do when that career that you were depending on all of a sudden isn't here? Well, I'm taking, I'm, you know, ante in it up a little bit. What about when life tells you that you're here and you think you're going to be here forever? You think your time on this planet is going to be 30, 40, 50 years from now. But all of a sudden, you get that call. And usually it's in the doctor's office. Usually it's in the hospital. Usually it's a note from some test that you had. You have this. You have that. You have cancer, diabetes, anything. But the bottom line is that those thoughts of being around for 30, 40, 50 years are all of a sudden about there's not going to be that much time left. And I said this before, we never know when the time that we have is going to be over. But this girl, her name is Holly Butcher, and she ended up passing away on the fourth day of January. Took a little, whether it was a blog or a little bit of the opportunity that she had to write down some thoughts. And she really puts a lot of things in perspective. And, you know, for somebody to be able to embrace their own mortality and the fact that their life at some point was going to be over, the message that she got out there was able to get her, perhaps, with people donating blood and helping her out with the issue that she had. She may have lived another year. But... The message that she sends pretty much is about what I just said and what I've been trying to push and the message I've been trying to get out here on the past ball show. We take so many things for granted, but also we put value in stuff and things that really doesn't deserve a ton of our time and really doesn't have the importance that we make it out to be. You know, we turn on, we watch the gossip and slander, and then we participate in gossip and slander. You know, somebody that is not as fortunate as you to be able to breathe, to be able to walk, to be able to have the use of all their limbs, to be able to have the mental capacity to have a conversation, and to be able to state a fact, and to be able to complain which we know we all do way too much. You know, she mentions that, hey, you could get caught in bad traffic today or you bad sleep because your, your, your children kept you awake. Your hairdresser cut your hair too short. Your new fake nails might have a chip. Your boobs are too small. Or you have cellulite on your arse and your belly is wobbling. These are all things that people complain about all the time. And the unfortunate thing about it is none of it matters. And you think of this this girl who is still, I mean, she is an adult by law. She's above 18. But she, I'm sure when she turned 18, she was expecting that she had a long time left on this planet. And she didn't. And it wasn't any fault of her, her own. It's just sometimes, you know, we all have this timeline, right? This expiration date that's set in our in our our bodies as a clock. Sometimes we're lucky enough to know when the end is near, but other times we're not. Other times it'll just happen. So you think once you cross over, once you're on the other side. How much does it matter, the little things that we make out into nothing? And this, this girl who, unfortunately, didn't know how much time she had left, only, only that it was going to be short-lived, says, I haven't started this note before I die so that death is feared. I like the fact that we are mostly ignorant to its inevitability. I want people to stop worrying so much about the small, meaningless stresses in life and try to remember that we all have the same fate after it all. 
So do what you can to make your time feel worthy and great. Minus the bullshit. And I tell you, I couldn't have said that any better myself. This was a person that could have spent time feeling sorry for herself. Could have said, hey, I want to go to the top of the mountain. I want to travel here. I want to do this. Everybody talks about that bucket list. And we make such a big deal about the bucket list. What's all these things that you accomplished once you're not here? You're not going to take those trophies with you to heaven. You know, God's not going to care that you climb the top of Mount Everest. He's not going to give you a participation trophy because you traveled to Italy. Yeah, she suggests things like, you know, buy your friend something kind. Value other people's time. Experiences instead of material things. These are all things that are valuable. And I hope, you know, I hope this, this young girl who obviously was taken from us a little bit too young, the age of 27, you know, her spirit lives on in eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the, the message out there is important. We spend too much time on number one, material things, but also number two, complaining and whining about stuff that really doesn't matter. <coughs> Excuse me. Hopefully by tomorrow I'll have this cold taken care of so I won't be coughing as much. But like I said, the biggest Christmas gift you could get me, get me a muzzle or get me a cough button. Something that I could keep that uh, sound from going out there. But, you know, this, this girl, you know, probably didn't have to do it. You know what? If you want to travel, travel. Don't. But work to live. Don't live to work. Seriously, do what makes your heart feel happy. Say no to things that you really don't want to do. Don't feel pressure to do what other people might think is fulfilling life. Everybody has a different definition of it. Just because somebody says that something is cool, if you don't feel it, if you're not on that same level, if you don't think that same thing is cool or fun, why are you going to do it? Don't do things for the sake of doing things. She also says, if something is making you miserable, you have the power to change it. You really do. You don't have to be around somebody that makes you feel unhappy. You don't have to be at a job that you hate. And, you know, I, I hope, and you see these messages that go out there periodically for people that find out that they have some kind of terminal illness and their time around here is not going to be that much longer and they spend the time to leave a little something. And sometimes a couple words like this are words of wisdom that could save somebody else's life. There are people that are spending way too much time, and I've said this time after time on the show Worrying about things that really are not that important. Sometimes it's things that we look at as entertainment, like sports or music or television shows. Or things that we tend to talk about at the coffee table or the water cooler. I think all that has some value. Not a lot of value, but has some so I'm not saying eliminate that all, but the priority that we put when it comes to stuff that really is not that important is a shame. And it's a shame that we continue to think that way. And I hope at some point we can move on from it and start to focus on helping each other, doing things for each other. And I tell you, we're lucky enough to be in this beautiful nation the United States of America, which is really, if you had a choice of any nation to be part of, wouldn't you want to be in a nation where everybody is accepted? We are all accepted when we're not, we're not bickering with each other. And I'm not ever going to make this show about politics. I refuse to. To me, it's not important enough. I don't care enough about politics to make it part of my show. 
But I tell you, we do need to care a little more about each other. And we need to have more of an open mind in regards to uh, differences that we have. There's things that are not the same about any one of us. You could take the person that looks exactly like me and we could probably find something that we don't have in common. But the key is to the understanding. The understanding that we're not all the same. We're not all a carbon copy. We're not made out of the same cookie cutter. So please, as I continue to preach this message on, ask each other questions. Care a little more about each other. And let's make this the perfect nation, or maybe not the perfect nation, but the the uh, most unified nation amongst different people that it could possibly be. I'll be back with you tomorrow, 6 to 7 p.m. on Periscope, Facebook Live, and On Demand on YouTube. God bless you, and as always, I'll see you on the other side.